Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I am very honored to be joined by uh, our two United States Senators. Uh, I appreciate what they have done for Mississippi uh, and I, over many, many years, uh, but particularly over the last several months as we have dealt with, uh, the, after, with the, uh, the event that is COVID-19. Now, I know that this will not be popular in the national media, but I will tell you that I have been very impressed with the federal response. People want to gloss this over, but this is a fact. No American has died from coronavirus because our hospital system was overwhelmed. In other countries, they ran out of ventilators. In other countries, they ran out of ICU beds. In some other countries, they ran out of beds altogether, but not in America. That's largely because of the leadership of President Trump, Vice President Pence, our Coronavirus Task Force, and our quick response by the United States Congress. That simply doesn't get said enough. People shift the goalpost and they'll find a new way to attack the president. But I really think President Trump deserves our prayers, our gratitude, and our support. The same is true with our senators. They have done a tremendous job on the response. They have passed four different pieces of legislation the largest one being obviously the CARES Act. That legislation has given us as governors across the country the resources we need to manage this emergency. There are other conversations to be had and I support uh, the leadership of our senators. It has, the CARES Act provided help for small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program. It is helping Mississippians to survive the economic damage with stimulus checks. Our senators have advocated for Mississippi every step of the way. I'll just give you one example. Early on in this process, uh, we sat down with our Mississippi Department of Employment S Security and talked about the various things that we as a state needed to do uh, to respond. One of the things that m is in Mississippi law, uh, which I think is a good thing in normal times, is that prior to being able to apply for unemployment assistance, you have to have been off work for at least one week. Because we knew there were going to be tens of thousands of Mississippians that were going to be let go through no fault of their own because of the government taking action, we decided early on to waive that one week requirement. In the CARES Act, because of the advocacy of our senators and those uh, throughout uh, our country, the federal government has decided to pick up the tab for that extra week. That is just one small example of all of the things uh, that they have done uh, to help us. Now, there are a lot of people uh, who want all of our resources at the federal level to, to just go to big states with big cities. But our senators have been champions for our small town way of life. They care about our people and it's evident to me in their work. Now, we currently have a lot going on at the state level. We delivered 860,000 masks to all 82 counties just yesterday. 1,200 gallons of hand sanitizer, over 1,000 containers of disinfectant wipes just yesterday. All of that is because our senators have secured the funds for states to pay for all of these unprecedented expenses. I invited them here today to provide an update for the people of our great state on all of their hard work and I'm honored that they accepted my request. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our senior senator, Senator Roger Wicker, uh, for an update. Thank you, Governor Reeves. I appreciate the invitation to be here and also the invitation to be um, uh, present with my colleague, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. It's great to be back together. I'll begin with a brief report on the CARES Act. The CARES Act was signed into law March 27th. It's hard to believe it was only one month and two days ago that this law was signed by President Donald Trump. This new law is giving businesses large and small resources to keep workers on the payroll. For small businesses, much of these loans will be forgiven. For larger businesses, uh, we expect them to be paid back over time. For those Americans who already lost their jobs, we expanded unemployment insurance to help them through the pandemic. 
and we provided direct financial assistance for most working Americans. We decided this was the fastest way to deliver relief to people with the least amount of bureaucracy and red tape. The CARES Act was the largest bill ever passed by the United States Congress, and it was implemented in record time. That is not to say it's all gone perfectly. There have been some frustrations and hiccups and stumbles along the way, including the need for more money on the Paycheck Protection Program, which we passed last week. But overall, President Trump and his administration deserve great credit, as does Governor Reeves. We also need to continue providing effective oversight of these new programs to make sure the money is spent efficiently. The Senate will be back in session on Monday of next week. The House will return to Washington later. But there are a number of items the Senate can do on its own, and we'll begin to do that next week. We need to confirm pre the uh, President's nominees, including several nominees who will help with the COVID-19 response. We also should confirm more lifetime appointments to the federal bench. There are three vacancies that need to be filled from Mississippi. Our committees will be working on issues such as water resources and infrastructure, including rural broadband, and we need to resume work on the annual appropriations process. A lot of attention has been given to China during this discussion, to their conduct and misinformation campaign during this crisis. But we also need to keep in mind that China is continuing its military buildup, and so are our other adversaries around the globe. With that in mind, I'm leading an effort to prevent cuts in our defense spending and to protect defense manufacturing, including aircraft manufacturing and shipbuilding. This will be a good investment for our national security as well as for the thousands of small businesses and the millions of Americans that make up our military supply chain. And we have more to do, even with the massive efforts we've taken to date, the economy is still losing billions and billions of dollars each month during the shutdown. That's why it's so important that Americans get back to work. And as we do so, let me emphasize this. Reopening the economy does not mean ignoring the virus. We can and should be smart about the pandemic while getting back to work. Governor Reeves understands this balance and he's taking the right steps. For example, the governor's executive order last week included the resumption of elective medical procedures with precautions. This was the right call, Governor, and will be a boost to our hospitals which need the revenue, not to mention to sick people who needed the elective procedures performed. The governor rightly trusts doctors and health care providers as capable of making these decisions. So thank you, Governor, for that. As we reopen and recover, we need a huge expansion of testing. Congress appropriated $25 billion for testing last week. We need to be able to test Americans on a large scale so that we can isolate those who are infected and the rest of us can return to work safely. Mississippi has done a good job with testing, but we need to ramp up this effort across the country. We all need to do our part. If we do, I know we will overcome this just as Americans have overcome every previous challenge to come back better and stronger than ever before. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Senator Wicker, for your leadership, uh, not only your leadership for our state, but your leadership of our nation. At this time, I would like to ask uh, Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith uh, to also uh, address uh, Mississippians. Senator, thank you for being here. Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much for the opportunity that we can come here with press and have the audience that we have that's listening throughout the state. You know, no one could have predicted that the position that we're in right now, but uh, I think you've done a great job of handling that. To work with Senator Wicker has just been a pleasure. I tell you, his office has really stepped up. Our staffs are working 24-7. They are nonstop building calls, and as long with, as long with many federal agencies, 
One of the things when this first started that really concerned me because I grew up in a rural area is the rural hospitals. And, um, you know, the health care that has just been provided there during this trying times when everybody is so afraid. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid for their families. And, you know, the least cough, the least uh, sniffle, they're uh, so concerned that they may be testing positive for COVID. And so the rural health care has been really important, and I stay very close to mine. The uh, two of the things that I have been uh, very pleased with is we had a conference call this morning with Secretary Azar, Health and Human Services. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they have already done before today, they agreed to set aside $10 billion specifically to help rural health care providers. And uh, that money should go out to the rural health care workers in the hospitals either the end of this week or the first of next week. The second thing is some of our county-owned hospitals were not covered under the Paycheck Protection Program. So uh, the Treasury amended its regulations to make sure that our small county-owned hospitals are eligible now for that. You know, there's so many issues that pop up, and I've had the opportunity to speak with nurses on night shifts that uh, they were afraid, not only for their patients, they were afraid for their lives. And to think about those suffering from COVID and to think about those who are treating those patients that are suffering from COVID. This has been a huge challenge for Mississippians, but I could not be more prouder for our state in the way that it's been handled. You know, to look at the University Medical Center <clears throat> that came up with their own ventilator, how innovative that was for them to do that. And Forest General and Hattiesburg Clinic and with USM to come up with their testing kits you know, that is just saying we're not depending on government for everything. We're stepping up and using the resources we have to handle this as well. And at Mississippi State, when we had the portable ventilators and they transferred them to electric ventilators that they could plug in, Mississippians, as usual, have, they've done a fantastic job at heeding the advice of the CDC of not looking for government for absolutely everything but helping themselves and helping our state could not be prouder of that. And uh, of course, we have the 310 billion for the SBA paycheck protection programs. How many small business owners have I talked to that this has been their saving grace? It is not perfect. The CARES Act, I assure you, is not perfect in any way. But to be given the circumstances that we were given when we were in Washington, D.C., before we left to come home to deal with this in our home states, the magnitude of that and the way that we put it together through people who are able, people who are very competent, prudent people, to come up with that plan as massive as it is, it's worked pretty darn well. I can assure you, I've, uh, I've been so impressed with the calls that we've gotten to say, you know, we have hiccups, we've had errors, we've had things, and thank you for making sure that it was there. It's my, our job, Senator Wicker, and my job is to get the money to the state of Mississippi, to get it throughout the country, to make these decisions, but we cannot depend on government for everything. You know, we can't keep shoveling money out and expect the basic fundamentals of economics to work. We know we have got to get this country going again. But to be there, to be part of that, to construct the legislation and trying to consider every caveat possible to make sure that when we came in, we know we were on the beginning stages of this, but to roll out these phases that we've rolled out in the timely manner that we've rolled them out is pretty incredible. You can be a proud American when you look at that capital and you realize, you know, this was unprecedented beyond the meaning of unprecedented. But we stepped up and we made sure that we came out with a plan that the states can continue. So proud of President Donald Trump and his staff, the leadership that he has shown, the duress that he has had to uh, endure during this time, but continuing every moment, literally night and day, to make sure we have the things in front of us that uh, we need. On top of all of this, the Easter tornadoes. The governor was so gracious in allowing me to fly over the tornadoes that where the damage occurred in southern part of the state and then having another two tornadoes at one time 
and then having another one to follow after that. The devastation of that on top of COVID, I assure you, when we landed and put on our mask and we were looking at the people that had just lost their homes, they really weren't worried about COVID during that time. <clears throat> and to think of the challenge that has, that has been for Mississippians and the way the governor got the relief package started and uh, got the declaration signed. And, uh, you know, that's going to go on for a while. That's not going to end very soon, just like with the opening of the country. I've said all along, the worst thing about going through this, as bad as going through this, would be going through it twice. And to look at the way that we're handling this, the way we're getting the uh, message out through our Department of Health, through Dr. Dobbs, who has done a fantastic job. But people, the Mississippians, you've got to continue to listen. The virus is still out there. It is still real. Our numbers today were over 200 new diagnoses, and we had more deaths yesterday. So it is still there. We're living in a new world. And I think we're going to be changed forever. I don't think we're going to go back to business as normal, and we don't need to go back to business as normal because it is there. We're still under a significant threat. We do not need our health care centers overloaded. We do not need a resurgence and another occurrence to come about with uh, making things worse. We need you to continue to practice those safe cautions to continue to wear masks when you can, to wash your hands, all those sanitation things that uh, we've just been so well reminded of. We've learned a lot of lessons, but guys, when we move forward, we need to continue these lessons. We need to continue getting on the other side of COVID-19. We need to continue these practices. This economy is going to rebound. It's going to come back but it's because we're doing the right things. I just ask, beg, and plead that we continue to do those practical, safe things. Business owners, when you open up those businesses, don't let crowds come into your store. You're going to have to enforce these regulations. Everybody wants the economy to start back. Everybody wants to get back to business as usual, but we can do this together. You know, God is sovereign. We're going to get on the other side of this. And one of the things that my family has started to do is when we pray before we eat, you know, I always say, first thank God, then thank a farmer. Now I'm adding the third thing to that. Let's pray every time we start to eat, because we do that real regular, that we have God's guidance with this virus and that we can continue to get on the other side of this. Thank you for this opportunity, and uh, we are certainly here in my office. My staff is willing to help anyone that has an issue. You call my office, and we will be there to assist you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You know, the very first call that I had um, regarding COVID-19 with President Trump, uh, he made it clear, and Vice President Pence has made it clear in every call we've had since then, and, and there have been dozens. In every call, uh, they recognize that the federal act that has always handled disasters in this country, the Stafford Act, contemplates that these natural disasters, these disasters that occur, are state managed, locally executed, and federally supported. And what I can tell the people of Mississippi today is th these two senators and our members of Congress as well, our House of Representatives, um, they could not have been more supportive, and President Trump and his team could not have been more supportive of what we're trying to do uh, in our state. They made, for instance, Dr. Burks available to us last week to have a call to talk about our data and talk about our numbers so that they could, so that we could uh, make sure that everyone knew what we were seeing and why we were making the decisions that we we're making. And we got confirmation that we're doing the right things in Mississippi. But when we talk about federally supported, these two could not have been more supportive to the people of our state. And I just want to personally thank both of you very, very much. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Dobbs and Matt to come forward. And thank you, Senators. And I'll call on Dr. Dobbs to give us an update on Mississippi's data. All right. Let me demask, and I'll be be ready to go. <laughs> thank you, Governor. Um, I would like just to say what a phenomenal resource we have um, in our Mississippi de delegation to, to D.C. 
you guys have been so supportive and everything that we've needed and y'all have reached out to me making sure that that we had what we need so it's just it's really just been a fantastic experience and just can't tell you how much public health and state of mississippi appreciate you and me personally um Stepping into uh, update for the day, we have some very interesting information. Um, reported 227 new cases today and 11 new deaths. So really a, a pretty strong reminder that there's still a lot of cases out there. Um, certainly we've had a lot higher reports per day, but we, we're going to have a lot more. So it's important for people to stay vigilant. We are starting to report out our recovered case rate, and we'll report that out regularly. And we have uh, 3,413 recovered Mississippians to report that will be posted on our website. Um, if we look at other information as far as hospital utilization, we have some stability in the number of hospitalized patients at 430 compared to 429 yesterday with a modest uh, decline in ICU utilization from 162 to 151 and mechanical ventilation or you know the ventilators from 77 to 69. Um, of, of other uh, interest, we will have a graph posted um, daily on our influenza-like illness rate and also paired with our COVID-like illness rate. These are surveillance mechanisms that we use to track how people, what the symptoms people have when they come into the emergency room. And you can see pretty clearly that we've had a pretty significant decline in our flu-like illness um, you know, over the past several months. And then going back to mid-March to mid -March to early April, a steady decline in our COVID-like illness reports. And that'll be available on our website. And then the one last new bit of data we're in our ever, ever growing quest to get more information available to you guys. Um, we're also posting um, number of cases by sex and race. And so if we look at the number of African American males, um, 1,220 or 19% of the reported cases of African American women, 2,072 or 32% of the cases of uh, Caucasians, uh, Caucasian males were 14% at 918, and Caucasian females, uh, 1,195, or 18% of the case burden. Thank you, Governor. That's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. And again, I, I want to congratulate you and commend you and your team. We're continuously putting more and more data out there as more and more data becomes available. Uh, we have uh, committed to being transparent throughout this entire process, uh, and you and your team have worked very hard to continue to uh, enhance and increase the amount of information that is available to the, the general public. Uh, the most important thing that has been said today is that we are not out of the woods yet. We are continuing to make progress. Uh, we are headed in the right direction. However, uh, we still have to be vigilant. The most important thing that any individual in Mississippi can do is to take care of themselves and take care of their family members. Wear a mask when you go out. Uh, stay at home if at all possible. Go to and from work but please do not um, enter into groups of larger than 10 uh, for social gatherings, uh, et cetera, the very things we've been saying now for weeks and weeks on end. With that, uh, we've got uh, Director Michelle is, is out uh, working today, and so his uh, Chief Deputy, Matt, is gonna give us an update uh, from Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Matt. Thank you, Governor Reeves. Um, just want to give, give an update. Uh, first of all, thank Senator Wicker and, and his staff. They uh, Early on in this uh, response, uh, they offered up uh, an officer from the Department of Commerce, one of those procurement staff officers, and they've been in our building since day one. I'm working him about 15 hours a day, sir, but uh, that, that has allowed the state of Mississippi to get ahead of uh, some of those purchasing uh, hurdles that, that others have had, and that's just a Mississippi asset. That's, that's Mississippians taking care of, of uh, Mississippians. So I want to thank you for that, sir. Uh, just to give you a quick update of kind of the uh, normal state of emergency that, uh, that MEMA is in, we have about uh, three uh, disaster declarations that we're working. Uh, had some storms last night that moved through the state. About 4,500 or so were, were without a power. Uh, that's been destroyed. Uh, I mean, that, that's been restored, but uh, we had some minor damage, some trees on the road and things of that nature over multiple counties, but uh, no, nothing other than that. Uh, during our current uh, uh, April the 12th storm, we have over 1,190 registrations already uh, from those uh, survivors uh, in our survivor assistance centers in uh, over the three counties, uh, on, and that is Jones, Jefferson Davis, and, and Covington. Uh, and that's important to know that, that uh, UMCOR is out there with the uh, volunteer uh, groups, and they are assisting us with getting those registrations and getting those survivors taken care of and getting them the help that they need. Uh, moving on to uh, our February storms, the Pearl River, 
Uh, we have over uh, 11 counties that have been declared. Three more have met their threshold. We're gonna be adding those, sir. Uh, and also, um, when you move into the, uh, the COVID response, um, yesterday uh, we did the counties uh, logistical runs and also today we did the tier one hospitals and long-term care facilities uh, over 88 of those we did the central part of the state and uh, we averaged probably about uh, 72,000 masks uh, various types of gloves uh, disinfectants and other things and uh, as of uh, about one o'clock today we've already delivered to over 45 of those 62 facilities that we were headed to today so we continue with the Mississippi National Guard to uh, every day of the week deliver supplies that are needed to those facilities and also to the county as, as uh, they are responding to this as well. Uh, sir, that's basically all I have at this time for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I wanna thank uh, the Department of Health as well as the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency uh, working with our um, partner uh, agencies, particularly the Mississippi National Guard uh, and others. Um, every single Mississippian that is working on this response has stepped up in a huge way. Uh, I know that Senator Cindy Hyde Smith mentioned um, the staffs of uh, her office and Senator Wicker's office and of our office, but the reality is there are, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, state of Mississippi workers, federal workers that are stepping up to uh, to, to do what's right, to do what's best for Mississippians. And while it's sometimes difficult for any of us to, to find uh, reason for optimism in these very challenging times, I think if we'll sit down and think about what our friends and our neighbors are doing to help themselves and help their neighbors, uh, it, you, you can't help uh, but be optimistic uh, about the future. I know I certainly am. So again, I wanna thank um, everyone for being here. And at this time, I'll open it up to questions. We'll start with Courtney Ann. listening to, to the senators and, and they understand that there's money coming down from the feds, help them better understand that state managed, locally executed, federally supported. Average Joe at home may not feel like they feel that connected to what's happening in Washington right now, but it's trickling down to them whether they feel it or see it or not directly past a stimulus check. Right, well, you know, I think uh, with respect, I mean, and, and there's so many moving parts, there are so many moving parts uh, that are that are happening, and when we when we do our uh, our calls with uh, at least Vice President Pence and the Coronavirus Task Force, which the President gets on most every time, uh, but he is certainly a very very busy uh, person. Um, you know, we talk about the Stafford Act. The Stafford Act is actually the act that that we utilize, and MEMA particularly utilizes util the utilization of the Federal Emergency Management Agency to enact and get things done. And so when you talk about the, the Stafford Act, and the, what the, the entire act contemplates is that the state, and specifically in our state, the governor is in charge of the emergency response. Now we know that we don't have enough state assets that we can execute everything in Gulfport and everything in Tupelo all at the same time. So we depend upon our local partners and our local governmental entities to actually execute what the state is managing. The role of the federal government, and this is without any additional legislation, although we've had four different pieces of legislation passed uh, which provided additional help, the role of the federal government under the Stafford Act is to provide resources to the states and the governors, and specifically um, the director of the emergency management agency in each state, typically have to ask. We have to actually put our request into uh, FEMA, and what I will tell you is the administrator of FEMA has been very helpful to us. Uh, when we asked for an emergency declaration, for instance, an immediate emergency declaration for the tornadoes that occurred on Easter Sunday, those are very rarely granted. Uh, we worked with the FEMA administrator. I spoke with him on Monday morning after Easter Sunday, uh, and by Thursday, uh, when I had the opportunity to ask the president for that immediate emergency declaration one-on-one, uh, uh, -on -one, uh, he said it's already been done. It's been done a couple hours ago. And so those are the kind of things um, that is the way in which it, these, these things work. And, um, and it's critically important to have that relationship. Um, I know Senator Wicker and Senator Cindy Hyde Smith both had helped work uh, with um, the Department of Homeland Security, which is the agency that houses FEMA, uh, with respect to that specific issue. Again, it's a team sport. We are all working together 
uh, to make a difference for our citizens. Uh, there'll be plenty of time a year from now or, or, or maybe even sooner than that, I hope, to look back and say, well, I wish I had done this or wish I had not done that. But right now, we are focused on working together as a team to do what is best for our constituents. Um, and, and our senators have certainly played a major role in that. Yes, sir. I talked to a, uh, someone trying to apply for unemployment assistance, haven't been able to, tried and tried again. Uh, they say they don't care what happens in another state. They vote here in Mississippi and they have not been able to get into it. So it's the same for thousands of other Mississippians. Uh, is it time to do something, make a change to make sure you put someone in place that can do the job to make sure that Mississippians who are eligible for unemployment can get unemployment in an easier way? Yes, we, are, we, we feel for those individuals uh, that have not yet gotten through. Um, you know, one of the uh, great things about the, F the Federal CARES Act is that it expands the number of people that are eligible for unemployment. Uh, the Federal CARES Act that, that passed the Congress and was signed by President Trump now allows for instance, for those self-employed individuals, for those individuals that are employed by nonprofits, for those individuals that are um, employed by churches, for instance, are now eligible for unemployment assistance. That is a great thing. The, the, the challenge that it presents for uh, those of us that uh, are running state government is it just further increases the number of people who are applying. And so as we build capacity, which we're working very hard to do every single day, as you know, we have gone from 50 employees in a call center that was working 8 to 5 to now we have 250 employees working in a call center that are working from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And so we are continuing to staff up. We're going to continue to staff up. Um, and while I know it is frustrating um, to everyone that is, is trying to get approved, uh, we are continuing to work very, very hard to scale up and we'll continue to do so. Bobby? Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, do you, do you believe the legislature should have an in, uh, a say in the $1.25 billion that the state is getting through the CARES Act? And, and uh, I mean, the, does the language in the bill specifically say that the governors have the authority how that money is spent? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. First of all, I'll tell you, I think um, the, the legislature should have significant, uh, a significant role in how those monies are spent. Um, I, we have had um, many conversations with individual legislators, with the leadership, uh, with the chairman of appropriations in the Senate, uh, with the speaker and, and his team. Uh, we have had many conversations uh, with them over the last three or four weeks, and we're going to continue to have many conversations uh, with not only the legislature, but also we've had weekly conference calls with uh, the Mississippi Supervisors Association, including one yesterday. We've had weekly calls with the Mississippi Municipal League uh, um, uh, from the very beginning and getting their input as to how uh, those monies should be spent. And, and so um, we are also getting input uh, from those in the private sector, uh, those who know how the economy works, those who understand uh, the things that need to be done to get Mississippi's economy back open as soon as possible. And we're going to continue to have those conversations. And so what I would tell you is I think it's incredibly important that as we um, spend those funds that we do so in a collaborative way, uh, working with uh, folks across uh, the aisle, um, across the street, and really th across Mississippi. Um, in fact, just the uh, day before yesterday, I had a call with the leadership of the Legislative Black Caucus, and they uh, put forth six or seven different ideas on ways in which they suggested uh, that, that we as a state spend uh, our CARES Act funds. Um, wh what we are currently doing um, is, uh, is having many calls with uh, governors across the country as well. Uh, I have had uh, at least every other day calls with the National Governors Association or the Republican Governors Association and having conversations about what's going on in other states as well. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. Uh, we have had conversations uh, as well with Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, as you know, the, the CARES Act actually does a lot of different things. The CARES Act sends money directly to the Department of Health, for instance. The CARES Act sends money directly to the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, for instance. In addition to the money that is actually uh, sent to the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency through the Stafford Act. In addition to that, the CARES Act 
sends money directly to the Mississippi Department of Education um, for their allocation in, in these different times. Um, when you talk about um, what we are setting up um, and the, the direction that we are currently going is we're simply acting not only under the CARES Act and not only under the guidance that has been provided to the states by the Department of Treasury, which is very clear uh, that the CARES Act provides that payments from the fund may only be used uh, for necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency. So that's where the federal, that's what the guidance from Treasury says. In terms of Mississippi law, uh, Mississippi law is very clear. There was a law that was passed nearly four decades ago, uh, which states in part, whenever the federal government shall offer to the state funds for purposes of emergency management, the state acting through the governor may accept such offer and the governor may authorize any officer of the state or political subdivision to receive such funds subject to the terms of the offer and rules of the agency making the offer. And so for four decades, that's been the law of the land in Mississippi. Over the last two decades, I haven't been around four decades, but for the last two decades, uh, I have been involved in, in state government. And on three different occasions, uh, two different governors utilize these funds um, in exactly the same way that we are in the process of setting up uh, with an oversight uh, entity to make sure that every single penny that is spent through the CARES Act is spent in a way that complies with both the statute and the guidance, uh, which is critically important. And those three uh, scenarios where that has been the case, uh, first was in 2005, 2006, if you may recall, I was state treasurer at the time. Uh, then Senator um, Trent Lott asked me to come up and testify before the U.S. Senate Finance Committee uh, to talk about the Gulf Opportunity Zone Act of 2006. So uh, we went up and, and talked about that before the Senate Finance Committee. Money flowed to the state. Um, Governor Barber uh, utilized exactly the same model that we are currently setting up um, to, to do this. A couple years later, in 2008 and 2009, uh, the, um, we had a a terrible recession in our country. Uh, the federal government provided uh, funds through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, and, and you'll recall that in both, uh, and you know this well, Bobby, but in both 05, 06 and 08 and 09, uh, the Speaker of the House was Billy McCoy, uh, but the Governor uh, Barber used exactly the same model. And then more recently, uh, in the aftermath of the, the BP oil spill, uh, the Restore Act was passed by the Congress, and those federal funds have flowed uh, to the state um, and have been expended in exactly uh, that same manner. And so there's, there's pretty historical precedent uh, to that. So I can look it up and because you read it kind of fast, the code section for that bill. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I'll get it to you, but I'll read it for you again. Uh, whenever the federal government shall offer to the state funds for purposes of emergency management, the state acting through the governor may accept such offer and may authorize any officer of the state or political subdivision to receive such funds subject to the terms of the offer and rules of the agency, i.e. Treasury in this department, uh, making the offer. The issue that we have with the CARES Act, uh, I'll just tell you, and this is one of the reasons that uh, we are trying to move very, very quickly uh, in conversations with uh, members of the legislature, with the cities and the counties, et cetera, um, is because um, the money is available to the state until December 31 of 2020. So it is critical that we move and that we move fast. And, and therefore, um, we're going to continue to operate under uh, state law uh, as it currently exists. Um, and, and we look forward um, to knowing that there is a sufficient, there's an, a large number of resources. The other thing I'll tell you, Bobby, is, is that um, in talking to Senator Cindy Hyde Smith and talking to Senator Wicker, um, we've had a lot of uh, good conversations. There is more discussion in Washington um, uh, about a potential next bill. Uh, I think there's some, um, some discussion and some debate as to exactly what that bill is going to look like. There are many governors that have been very active on TV and otherwise um, asking for uh, additional help for our states. 
um, and, and potentially additional help for our cities and counties. The CARES Act is very specific that you cannot utilize any of that money for replacement of lost revenues. Well, the thing that we know is that given the current climate from a um, business perspective and the fact that, that some states more than others, certainly most states more than Mississippi, have had to shut down a portion at least of their, um, of their businesses, um, we're going to have revenue losses. And so we are hopeful um, and I think uh, we are optimistic that there will be an ad a additional conversation and, and potentially an additional bill uh, passed either by the Senate or the House or both in the coming weeks and months, okay. uh, which will help with that. And I'm certainly um, uh, supportive of a reasonable uh, amount of money uh, to go to that, um, recognizing the challenges that we have uh, from a national debt perspective. Renee? Uh, Dave Elliott from WLOX has a question. Dave? <coughs> hey, thank you, Renee. I have a question for Dr. Dobbs. Actually, two questions. In a perfect world, every single person in Mississippi would be tested. It's impossible because of the availability of tests. And do you foresee a day when that might be and when that may come where we'll see broader testing? And what are you looking forward to seeing in results for more antibody testing? I, I think I got most of that. There was a bit of a gap in the middle. Um, but as far as like what we're looking forward in testing, it is evolving to doing uh, more uh, targeted community testing, especially around high risk areas and people who have a sense of being exposed and, and, and certainly around outbreaks and around identified cases, basically sort of growing out our net. Um, as part of that, you know, this week we did announce with our drive through sites, um, sort of lowering the threshold for testing. And I'm happy to see that we've about doubled our testing at those sites. So I think that's working. Um, we are, we are, I've also started testing around, um, in long-term care settings, testing around every single case, and that's, that's starting to yield results. Um, we are looking at doing some targeted testing in high-risk communities and recruiting, uh, community partners. That's something we're working on actively. So, you know, re really getting out and, and doing a lot of testing, um, in the areas that need it most, um, where we have the highest case burden. And so, so we, we're looking forward to that. We're, we're having regular uh, conference calls with CDC um, about how do we implement that strategy and, and, and they've been supportive and we're looking forward additional forward to additional federal support that's being made available to us as far as supplies and, and that's really going to be very exciting. Um, you know we've been really we've done a really great job in Mississippi testing. Um, we've gotten a lot of attention for it um, and, and I think our model is good that lets all partners participate whether you're a clinic, whether you're a FQHC, whether you're um, a community organization, whether you're public health, whether you're a hospital, whoever you are, everybody has the role. And if everybody can work at their role at for a full capacity, we'll be most successful. Um, so, and we'll see, anyway, we'll see more testing. The antibody test is a really tricky one. Um, it doesn't have the therapeutic utility that most people think it does. Um, it just tells you if you maybe had it in the past, the accuracy is not looking really great. So we're still looking how to use that as far as like a diagnostic tool for docs. Um, for surveillance purposes, it does make sense, and we will be working on a surveillance plan that gives us an idea of understanding how many Mississippians have actually been inf infected. Dr. Dobbs, I think the, the initial part of his question was regarding uh, a potential goal mm -hmm. of testing every single Mississippian. And what I have said, um, well, I'll just, will you just touch no, on no, that please, for a minute? Please. Yeah, 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 <laughs> well, yeah. I, what I've said is just, yeah, maybe in, in a perfect world, there was a test in which we could test every single Mississippian every single morning f to see whether they were positive or not. And if they were positive, they wouldn't leave the house. And if you were negative, you could. But then you'd have to do it the next day, and then you'd have to do it the next day. And that's just not a realistic goal. Um, I will tell you, and these are a couple of stats that I think are important. Um, the first CARES Act provided about $5 billion for FQHCs. Uh, which have been really good partners for Mississippi, particularly in our uh, African American communities. They have many of them have really started uh, ramping up testing, um, and they, much like we did recently, uh, they have uh, expanded the number of, of people who can get tests. Um, and it's not just those that are sick or just those that have major symptoms. And so they've been a, a, a big help. The most recent bill that passed the Congress, uh, with the help and support of 
uh, of our two senators and our members of Congress uh, did provide $25 billion additionally for testing. Some portion of that's going to come to the states, and some portion of that's going to go to uh, the federal government, I'm sure CDC and others, to, to actually help uh, um, implement even more uh, testing throughout the country. It's, it's an important piece. We've said from the beginning testing is critical, uh, but it's not the only critical piece uh, to reopening our economy. Did you just want to touch on? Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you. You're obviously spot on. Um, you know, they want us to, to look at doing 2 percent of the population every month. Um, we're going to try to do that, but hit the high. We want to make it high impact with, with, with our testing. And so we're committed to pushing that through. Yeah, and I will tell you, I think um, as, as, as our capacity increases, I think our focus on those long-term care facilities is exactly the right place um, to be focused. Um, obviously, they're some of the most high-risk individuals in our state, um, and it seems that the virus tends to spread very, very rapidly in facilities such as that where people live um, and, and congregate. Renee? Uh, Emily from AP has a question. Emily? Hi, Governor. I have two questions. One is related questions regarding um, the wider expansion of opening businesses. One of them is, will Mississippi cut off unemployment benefits for people who choose not to return to work because they have concerns about their own safety, about getting the coronavirus? The second question is, will the state of Mississippi provide some sort of legal um, liability protection for businesses if they reopen and then they are sued by either customers or employees who become ill while, while interacting with that business? Let me answer the second one first. Um, I am supportive of Mississippi uh, providing liability protection for those businesses that are, that are getting uh, back open. Uh, I think that would be a very good step for uh, the state of Mississippi, and I will encourage uh, our leaders in the Mississippi legislature to pass legislation to do that. Um, I do believe it would be very hard, um, though not impossible, very hard for me to do that through executive order. Uh, but I think with the legislature announcing recently that they're going to be back in town in a few weeks, um, that, would be, that would be an excellent uh, piece of legislation uh, that they could uh, enact, uh, which would provide help uh, for our business owners and get them back uh, operational and back functional. I know that we have um, had conversations with our federal delegation. I think that would also be uh, an excellent uh, piece of legislation for the Congress to pass uh, and for the President to sign uh, to make it uniform across uh, the country that businesses that are working to get back operational had liability protection. Uh, with respect to the first question, uh, it's a little bit more complicated uh, than, than the first one um, because of the fact that the Federal CARES Act does make it, it does have a provision which allows for individuals who are unemployed uh, because of COVID-19, and to a certain extent it, it is a um, individual uh, decision that is made that you are eligible for federal benefits uh, for if you choose not to go to work because you aren't working because of COVID-19. But what I would tell everyone in Mississippi is all of these benefits are going to run out, and some of them are going to run out sooner rather than other, um, sooner rather than later. Uh, for instance, the additional $600 uh, in, in pandemic unemployment assistance runs out in July. And so those individuals that have been laid off that get an opportunity to go back to work, uh, I strongly encourage you, regardless of what the law may or may not say right now, uh, to take that job back um, and because you don't want to look up a month or so from now uh, and be um, unemployed because of COVID-19, but yet, um, but yet you turn down a job and now you don't have one a month from now. Now, I am confident that Mississippi uh, small businesses and business owners are going to work with their employees. Uh, I, I have the opportunity to talk to uh, business owners um, every single day. Uh, and they tend to, to love their employees. And if there is someone that fits into that high-risk category, if there is someone who is over the age of 65 that has pre-existing conditions, um, I think that, uh, look, in our order that is still in effect, we have them ordered to shelter in place now. 
And so those individuals need to uh, work with their employer and and um, and try to do the right thing. But um, but those th that is the, the answer to both of those questions. Thank you, Emily. Um, Jack from Perry Ledger has a question. Jack. Hey, I've got a question for Dr. Dobbs. It's actually on behalf of the uh, Carthaginian in Lee County. Uh, can you elaborate on the spikes in COVID-19 cases and uh, transmission in Lee and Scott counties? And is the Department of Health deploying added resources for uh, testing and transmission containment there? Uh, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So um, we've had a significant number of cases in Scott and Lee County and, and we have been paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, we have been working with uh, local uh, healthcare systems there. Um, we also are deploying additional resp epi response teams and outbreak investigation units for that specific area. Uh, we are doing a, 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 a testing event at Leak County and would be very happy to do one in Scott County if invited to do so. Um, so we are, we are committed to uh, investing a lot of resources in these areas because we have a lot of, a lot of cases. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, this is for Governor Reeves. Um, you mentioned the application of the Stafford Act as the foundation for the state's managed federally supported uh, philosophy. Uh, this is certainly true for localized emergencies like the recent tornadoes and other disasters. Um, but the, this pandemic is a national emergency and the absence of an early federal move, federally managed response resulted in shortages of PPE, something we have certainly felt in the state to the point that Lieutenant Governor has vowed to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, would an early cohesive national strategy help prevent those shortages as well as boosted our early testing efforts? Well, what I would tell you is that um, I think we did have an early uh, strategy by the, the federal government. As, as you have uh, heard President Trump say repeatedly, uh, much to the chagrin of Joe Biden and many other Democrats around the country, he was very early uh, to shut down travel to China, uh, particularly the Wuhan region of China. Uh, I think that went a long way towards the fact that our models, which once projected between 250,000 and a million Americans uh, dying uh, from this horrible virus, uh, has been uh, reduced significantly, and certainly that has been the case uh, in Mississippi. Uh, with respect to shortages of PPE, uh, there is no question that, uh, that the country did not, um, did not uh, anticipate uh, a pandemic the likes of which we haven't seen in 102 years uh, in America. And so it did leave each of our states uh, and our federal government scrambling to ensure that, that we had adequate uh, PPE, that we had adequate ventilators. You know, that's the thing that I often uh, find uh, somewhat disturbing about this whole crisis is just a few weeks ago, um, and this is primarily dealt with the um, the national media. The only thing the national media wanted to talk about was ventilators. We as a country were going to run out of ventilators and and that was going to lead to individuals in our country that could have been saved that were not saved because we didn't have adequate ventilators. Now we have states sending ventilators to other states and we have our country sending ventilators to other countries. Uh, in our state it was projected at one time that we would have approximately a thousand Mississippians on ventilators uh, today. I know yesterday, or the day before yesterday, we had 78. Uh, that may have upticked a little bit, four, five, six, eight percent in the last couple of days. But again, less than, than one in 10 what was originally projected. And that's because uh, we have managed through this in a uh, very challenging environment in the correct, proper way. And so I, I will tell you, the, the federal government has been a great partner for us. Uh, there is no doubt. You can look at states' testing numbers, and you can see which states were focused on testing weeks and weeks and weeks ago when some only wanted to talk about ventilators and which states were not. It is very, very evident uh, that those states that were very early into testing, and I give all of the credit to Dr. Dobbs and his team. They have done yeoman's work. Um, they partnered with the University of Mississippi Medical Center. They partnered very early with the University of Southern Mississippi and Forest General in putting together their testing sites uh, and their testing capabilities. Uh, they, they were utiliz utilizing the state health lab 
for the most important cases that were already at hospitals. They had a testing strategy in our pandemic plan, and we executed it. That's what we did in Mississippi is we executed our plan. And every single day, we're continuing to look at the data, we're continuing to look at the resources we have available, and we're continuing to execute our plan. And we're going to continue to do that uh, until uh, someone uh, with a higher power tells us we can't do that anymore because we are committed to get every single available resource to the people of Mississippi in as expedited a way as possible and get it to them so that they can use it now, not eight months from now, not eight years from now, but as soon as humanly possible because now is when people are hurting. Now is when the people of my state, my constituents are hurting and I'm going to do everything in my power to get that done. And I'm going to work with our federal partners uh, to make it a reality. You hadn't seen me sitting up here complaining about what the federal government has or has not done. Mississippians step up. We work with our federal delegation. We work with our federal partners. We work with the president. And when we can't get something from them, we figure out a way to make a ventilator at the University of Mississippi Medical Center with $50 worth of supplies from local hardware stores. That's what Mississippi is all about. And so I can't comment on these other states. Rob. Oh, thank you, Governor. Uh, my question is about sports. When it, when it comes to no, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to college football, do you have to consult with league commissioners uh, about how safe the state is, or is that too far in advance? Well, I will tell you this. I, I told one of my fellow governors the other night that I'd probably pay $200 right now to watch him and another governor play ping pong with each other. That's how interested I am in getting um, organized sports back. Uh, together. Um, the, with respect to college football, I think particularly uh, when you talk about the Southeastern Conference, uh, you talk about um, the, the, the Jackson State, you talk about University of Southern Mississippi, I think we're going to work with uh, the leagues, but I think the leagues are probably going to be uh, leading the charge with respect to that. We'll deal with, um, with our public health officials. Uh, I don't think any league is going to be able to open until every state is comfortable uh, that that is the right approach to take. Um, and, you know, we, we are in uh, late April. Uh, we've got May, June, July, and then ultimately August. Uh, I've heard a lot of different proposals out there. I've heard we could start a little bit earlier because the heat's going to kill the virus, and I've heard we could start a little bit later and go until December. Um, I don't know the answer yet, Rob. Uh, I wish I did because uh, I can assure you that my kids are very, very interested in getting back out on the basketball court and back out on the soccer field. I hear it every single day. <laughs> yes, sir. Governor, uh, Senator Highsmith referenced to the fact that the coronavirus may come back possibly in the fall. Is there a place for, or is there a plan in place for uh, businesses to continue social distancing possibly until the fall? Well, I think we'll have to look at what the numbers do. Um, I'll let Dr. Dobbs uh, react to what he thinks the probabilities are of the coronavirus coming back in the fall. But it seems like a, a real possibility based upon the experts that I have read. We don't know that the, it's going to, but it certainly seems like a real possibility. I will tell you that the, the possibility of, the, of it coming back in the fall is also one of the reasons that the flexibility in the CARES Act uh, for the governors is so important uh, because we don't want to spend every single penny uh, of that of those resources today and not have any resources available if it comes back in the fall because we want to make sure that we're utilizing our resources on PPE so that we're re rebuilding our state stockpile so that we are in a better spot in the fall if in fact it comes back. I think if we as a um, health care system uh, are in a better spot if and when it comes back, if we have um, continue to build capacity, for instance, at the state health department where we can continue to build their contact tracing teams, et cetera, and we want to continue to offer any resources that they need to continue to do that, um, then, then we can be even better prepared this time uh, than we were uh, in the spring. Dr. Dobbs, you want to react to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, we'll learn more as we go through this. It's, you know, some of these serologic surveys we're looking at, you know, looking at case rates, population-based rates and stuff like that will, will inform us a little bit about where we're going. Um, it's, it's too early to say, you know, it's not going away anytime soon and we're sort of easing out of the, the restrictions of the social distancing and the businesses and all that sort of thing. So um, uh, 
more information will be here, um, you know, day by day, day, week by week, we're learning a ton. And, um, and then we'll just be prepared. Um, it'll be so much better. Go, if we had, just imagine you had three months of lead time on coming into this, how much better it'd be. So um, we'll, we won't waste that time. Renee? Governor, uh, President Trump just an hour or so ago said that the federal government's coronavirus social distancing guidelines will be, quote, fading out when they expire tomorrow, and that it'll be counting on states to take charge in terms of that guideline and reopening. Do you find that a bit unusual since we've heard how important that is relative to containing this virus, and how would you approach that? If social distancing is again being faded out on a on the national level, right? Uh, I, I didn't see what the president said. I was in a meeting. Um, I've been in a lot of meetings here over the last uh, well, I guess the last twenty years of my life, but certainly over the last uh, twenty weeks. The, so I don't know exactly what the president said, but I'm not surprised that he said that. If you'll recall, back in the middle of March, the president, the vice president, the coronavirus task force put out a guidelines for 15 days to slow the spread of the virus. I think when they put that out originally, uh, they thought that it would be in effect for 15 days um, and that would be adequate. As we got towards the end of March, uh, what we found is, what they found in talking to governors and other leaders around the country, that perhaps uh, they needed to do more. And so that's why at the end of March they put in uh, 30, day, 30 more days to slow the spread of the virus, which included the social distancing guidelines and, and other measures that they put in place. A week or so ago, they provided uh, Dr. Dobbs and his team, uh, myself and our team, uh, what they called guidelines for reopening our, our state's economies. They had measures, they had gates in place, they had three different um, scenarios in terms of uh, what was ready to open when. And so I think if, if, if the president were asked, and I certainly don't want to speak for him, but I think what he would tell you is different states are in such different parts of their curve where the state of New York is and the state of Louisiana is and where the state of California is and where the state of Washington is and where the state of Mississippi is, is vastly different. And therefore, uh, he has been very adamant over and over and over throughout this process that governors have the responsibility of making decisions for their states on when to reopen in an emergency. Um, it is the governors that have to lead. And I will tell you, these decisions that we've had to make over the last um, number of weeks are without question the hardest, most difficult decisions of my career, and not just my political career. And, and I'll remind you that uh, before I got into politics, I managed money for a living for uh, institutions and individuals. And so I was making buy and sell decisions for securities for individuals um, with their life savings. And those were hard decisions. But it prepared me to come in and, and actually know that if we're making the right decisions for the right reasons based upon data, that we will come out of this better off. And so I'm not shocked that the president has made that decision. I was wondering exactly what direction he would go on April 30th when his current 30 days to slow the spread expires. Uh, and so I'm, I'm still interested. We have we spoke on Monday, but have not spoken the last 24 hours. So, and I didn't see the the announcement. Renee, um, Jack from Green Ledger has another question. Jack. Yeah, um, I wonder if the governor or uh, Dr. Dobbs could definitively say whether there are any coronavirus outbreaks at Mississippi chicken plants. Um, I can say that. Um, we do have cases among workers who are in chicken plants, but we have no evidence of an outbreak in chicken plants. We have workers in every industry who have uh, coronavirus. And so, um, so, you know, it's something we're looking at closely, but we have no evidence of any transmission occurring within uh, poultry plants, Mississippi. I think that's an adequate answer. I can't, I can't build on that. Renee? Um, Kobe from MPB has another question. Kobe? Hey, uh, Governor. I also wanted to ask, um, what was your time when the Paris funds started to roll out? Could you repeat that question? I couldn't. You, you broke down on me. Oh, sorry. 
Um, what's your timeline for having the CARES Act funds start to roll out? Well, again, the, the CARES Act funds are already rolling out. The CARES Act has a tremendous amount of uh, money going to a large number of places. There's money that went directly to the Department of Health. There's CARES Act money that went directly to the FQHCs. There's CARES Act money that went to the Department of Education. There's CARES Act money uh, that went directly to hospitals. In fact, if you look at the CARES Act, $150 billion was designated for states, municipalities, and local territories, including the District of Columbia. It's $150 billion. In the CARES Act, there was $130 billion for hospitals. In the supplemental that passed most recently, there was an additional $70 billion for hospitals. So now CARES Act plus CARES Act II, if you will, had a $200 billion for hospitals and only $150 billion for state and large municipalities. Bobby. Doc, uh, real quick, how many tests are y'all, I mean, what's the turnaround from test to state lab now, and how many, what's your capacity per day? Um, our current capacity is about 650, um, running, you know, running basically overlapping shifts. Um, our demand has dropped, but as we're doubling our testing uh, volume at the mobiles, that makes me happy. We'll get, we'll kind of soak up some of that capacity. Um, you know, we're pretty much running them the day we get them. So, you know, there's no backlog. Um, the, if, there's, if there's delays, it's primarily going to be in transportation. Last question, Courtney, and I've got a 3.30 I've got to run to, so go ahead. Speaking of the testing and, and turnaround time, you had mentioned, I believe it was last week, that you were hopeful that we would see more rapid test um, availability from the feds and others. What's the status of that, if anything's changed? Okay. We, are, we are working on that. Um, we know some of the rapid tests that are available, um, Cepheid and Biofire, just a couple of names. Um, we've heard and been talking to, to hospitals that they're getting a little bit more. Um, uh, we actually had a call with our CDC, Federal Partners, HHS, trying to figure out how to get more of that. Um, still, still a bit of a struggle, but we hopefully see a light at the end of the tunnel. I will just uh, tell you that on a recent call, uh, Admiral Gerrard uh, did mention that, that they were hopeful that uh, the Abbott Labs uh, quick test and others would get up to uh, fairly quickly production of 350,000 testing uh, capability per week. I, I did. Uh, on that call uh, with the Vice President and Dr. Burks and, and the Admiral, uh, go ahead and put in my official order for Mississippi's 1%, our fair share. Uh, they thought that was very humorous, uh, or at least <laughs> Admiral Gerard and Dr. Burks did. I'm not so sure the Vice President thought it was nearly as humorous as, uh, as the two of them did. Uh, but we're going to continue to work with our federal partners uh, to get more and more of those tests because that is, that is important, particularly in those areas like healthcare space, et cetera, where you know these workers or have to be dealing with COVID patients, and we want to make sure that they're not infected and therefore infecting their family members at home and their fellow workers and ultimately fellow patients. Long-term health care facilities is another prime example of where if we could get an immediate uh, test result back in 15 minutes, we could make sure that someone that had symptoms wasn't in a facility where there was high risk. So, again, thank you all very much for being here. Thanks for all you're doing for Mississippi, and God bless.